Okay. Can this I is an interview with Robert Cahill, Hampton Inn, Newburgh, New York, uh, January 8th, 2003, approximately 10, 15 a.m. Interviewers are Michael Russert and Wayne Clark. Would you tell me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Robert L. Cahill, September 11th, 1924, Beacon, New York. Okay. What was your uh, school background or your education prior to entering military service? Graduate of Beacon High School in 1942, and I was drafted in 1943. Okay. Um, could you tell me where you were and what you remember about hearing about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was in the city of Newburgh, as a matter of fact, at a football game on a Sunday morning, obviously. It was more, more early afternoon, I guess, here. And they made an announcement over the PA system. And everybody in the, in the crowd said, where is Pearl Harbor? Just a week ago, I met one of my, former, my POW buddies who was from Newburgh, and we were talking about Pearl Harbor. And he mentioned the fact that he was at the same football game and the same reaction from people. Where was Pearl Harbor? Mm -hmm. Um... <clears throat> Okay, so you, you uh, were drafted yep. into the Army Air Force? Air Corps. Well, it started in those days you went into the Army. Mm -hmm. I was drafted into the Army in April, I think it was. Went to uh, Greensboro, North Carolina for basic training. After basic training, they decided where you went. Mm -hmm. And I was sent to radio school in Scottfield, Illinois, which was <clears throat> the Air Force. Some fellows were sent to different div di different things which made them p part of the infantry or something else. Mm -hmm. So you were trained as a radio operator? Yep. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit about your training? And well, I was in Scottfield, Illinois, which was a very hot place in the summertime, and that's when we were there. And the thing that I remember most very monotonous listening to da 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 and for an hour at a time in a hot and they didn't have air conditioning in those days mm -hmm. and after about a half an hour if you looked up half of the guys had fallen asleep in the pens and, and I'd done that many times and they, I got up to about 25 words a minute didn't use much of it uh, I don't know why they sent us to school because we never used code in combat it was all voice whatever we used was voice but there was very little uh, of any communication, anything that would help the enemy. Now, you were also trained as a gunner? Yes, that started in Dalhart, Texas. Yuma, and then they sent us to Yuma, Arizona. <clears throat> then we went over to uh, a place in Florida to finish our training. It was called phase training. We, we actually did some practice bombing and uh, and some gunnery work from a flying, you know, B-17. I can't remember the name of the place at this time. But it was, uh, then we went to Salt Lake City where we were put on permanent crews and then we went into combat. So basically that was your crew for yes, all ex together? Yes, except we lost the, uh, the co-pilot. I don't remember why. They changed co-pilots on us. I have no, no understanding why. Mm -hmm. uh, you were assigned to B-17s? B-17s, Flying Fortress. Mm -hmm. Now, did you, how did you get to Europe? Uh, did you fly? or? We uh, left Salt Lake City and went into Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, spent a few days in Atlanta. And then we went up the uh, coast to Bangor, Maine, to Newfoundland, to Iceland, to the Azores, to Marrakesh, into Foggia, Italy. Okay, what was your unit assignment? Uh, what unit were you assigned to? 97th Bomb Group, 341st Bomb Squadron, in the 15th Air Force. Okay. Um, did you uh, keep the same plane? Yes, the same <laughs> plane. It was a brand new plane that we took over with us. Did you uh, decorate it with any nose art or anything? Name it? We just named it. Our, our pilot's name was uh, Fetty, and we called it Fetty's Fools. That's all. Mm -hmm. 
did you ever decorate your jackets or anything? Well, I was a prisoner of war so fast after I got over there that it didn't give me much time to do anything like that. Okay. I was shot down on my second mission. Oh, okay. All right, well, would you describe your first mission and then your second mission? And well, the first mission was to Ploesti. It was not the famous Ploesti raid, but it was one of the worst targets that you could have to go on. And I do remember and I remember it more now than when I was younger, that it was the first time when I fired my 50 caliber machine gun and somebody fired back at me that I realized that he was trying to kill me and I was trying to kill him. I had gone through training and it never really dawned on me, at least the way I, I recall now, that I might get killed or that I was going to be killing other people. But a humorous thing happened to me. When I got out of um, basic training, I had worked in the post office in Beacon, and they offered me a job in a post office in Atlanta, Georgia. And I didn't want that. I'm from a family of eight brothers, eight boys, and seven of us were in, six of them were already in service. I was the seventh. And I wanted to go fight the war. As I'm flying over Ploesti on a Sunday morning and they're shooting at me, flak is coming up and I'm very nervous and quite honestly just about ready to heave up, I thought I could be in Atlanta, Georgia in a sunny spot sorting mail right now. That's how bright I was. Okay, um, could you describe your second mission then? Second mission started out, we were going to Vienna, and uh, we were starting in over the, the target, and the flak was very heavy, and we got hit in the number two engine. Uh, and I was on the, the left side of the plane, and a big yellow sheet of flame. You were a waste gunner then? Waste gunner, right. Big yellow sheet of flame came by, and the pilot says, get the hell out of here before this thing blows up. So I didn't stop and ask him why or anything else. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we, the sick, no, see, B-17 is divided by the bomb bay. There are five people up front, five people in the back. We all got off the intercom and we went out. The five in front, or four, had to go past the pilot's feet. He held them up because he got the fire out, but they got hit again in another engine and they crash landed and they were picked up by Yugoslav uh, partisans and they were taken back to Italy. I hit the ground and we were taught to free fall as far as we could. We were flying at about 20,000 feet when we hit. I couldn't tell you what the altitude was when I jumped out, but we were taught to free fall so that the enemy couldn't see us land. Well, I tumbled once and decided I was going to find out if the parachute was going to work or not work right now. And fortunately it did. I hit the ground, grabbed my chute, ran across a, strip, a road, hit it in some bushes, and, and uh, I was heading in a direction that I thought was the right direction. And around the corner came three civilians on bicycles with lengths of iron pipes in their hands and they stopped me right away. And we were taught <clears throat> to use the universal word of aid, and if they were partisan, they might help us. Well, when I said aid, they, they kind of laughed like hell at it, at me, and rousted me down the street to a flak battery. A flak battery had, I was amazed at the age of the kids who were in that flak battery outside of, say, the lieutenant and maybe a sergeant, they were probably 15, 16 years old. And they took me, it was a Sunday morning, and they took me on a walk. I had my fly, fur flying suit on, boots, everything. A walk of about five or six miles to an Air Force base. But on the way, the scariest moment happened. Uh, an air raid shelter was emptying out 
and the people were coming out, and these two uh, non-coms who were taking me to the air thing were behind me. And the people began to throw rocks at me, spit at me, curse me. They started to walk slower, and the distance between them and I got greater, and I thought, well, I made it this far, but I'm not going to make it much further. But uh, they didn't do anything. They didn't come near me other than to get close at me and spit at me and, you know, make motions and things like that. But it was probably the scariest moment of my my time in combat, in captivity, and everything. I thought the end had come. And if I could back up, I, I got it. I'd love to tell this part of the story. It's again humorous. I grew up in Beacon, and there was a place called the Alps. It was a Greek candy shop and soda fountain. And we used to hang around there after high school and everything. And it was down the street from a Catholic church. And in those days, church was 10.30. And after 10.30 mass, we'd all meet down there and decide where we were going that Sunday or what we had done the night before. Well, it was about 11 o'clock in the morning, usually, when that happened at 11.30. And when I bailed out of the airplane, it was somewhere between 11 and 11.30. And a lot of people don't believe this story, but I said, I wonder what they're doing at the Alps right now. <laughs> now, the psychiatrist who interviewed me for uh, <coughs> compensation said that was probably, you wish you were there. But a lot of people find it hard to believe, but it's a true story. And then we're, I was interviewed by, I was put in a room about 8 by 10 with a door with a great a window very high and on the back wall, another window very high, and a bunk, a bed, cot. And I thought, my God, if I'm going to send a, spend the war in here, I'll, I'll go nuts. But that was only temporary. They took us out and they interrogated us, and uh, they asked me my name, rank, and serial number, which I gave them, and then they asked me some other questions, and I said, well, <clears throat> I can't tell you anything. You know that. We said, Sergeant, you, need, you don't have to tell me anything. I can tell you what you had for breakfast, who your briefing officer was, what your uh, alternate target was, everything that we need, you could tell me we already know. And there was a bombardier who was, we were then let out in the courtyard, and there was a bombardier there, and I asked him what they asked him, it wasn't our bombardier, it was another crew, what they asked him about the Norden bomb site. He said they didn't ask anything, and he said they told me that they knew all about the Norden bomb site, but the problem was they didn't know how to duplicate the lens. And obviously, so I couldn't tell them that. Because they were always blown up just before they left the aircraft. And from there, <clears throat> we were taken up by train, by boxcar, in what was called 40 and 8s. And uh, from Vienna to the Baltic Sea, in East Prussia, it was East Prussia at the time, in a place called Grustau, where there was a Stalag Luft for prison camp. It's all Air Corps people. And the boxcar is supposed to hold 40 men and 8 horses. Well, they must have had 50 or 60 of us in the boxcar, and they had us in half of the boxcar, and the two guards had the other half. And on the way to, which took probably a day and a half to get there, I fell asleep standing up. It was, I couldn't fall down, we were so crowded. When we got off the train, we had been given Red Cross parcels with toiletries and things like that. Were you ever given any food? Not yet, not yet. A cup of coffee in, in Vienna, which was Airsat's coffee and uh, was awful. Uh, now, were you with... Uh other fellows that were with you, your crew members from your airplane? Um, four of them were there, yes. One of them wasn't, three of them were. The tail gunner broke his ankle, so they took him to a hospital. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we got off the, the, the train, and the German guards were there with police dogs. And it was about a five-mile uphill climb to the prison camp. And they started to race us up the hill, bayoneting, sicking dogs on us. And we didn't find out until later why they did it. 
or what was supposed to have been the reason, the uh, German officer in charge of the prison camp, his family had been killed in Berlin in an air raid by American airmen. And if they dropped, if the guy dropped a parcel, why they stopped bayoneting and everything. But we managed to make it and get into the camp. And another interesting thing happened to me. I walked into the prison camp and a fellow was leaning up against the administration wall and he says to me, what the hell are you doing here? He's from Beacon, a friend of mine. We worked on the same golf course during the summer when we were in high school. And, <coughs> excuse me, it was a new prison camp and they hadn't finished the, the fourth complex. So we slept in tents for maybe 10 days two weeks. And we started to build, build trenches around the tent so when the rain came down, water wouldn't come in. Germans thought we were trying to dig a, a trench to get out of the place. Uh, the people who took care of us, the Germans who took care of us, were not the brightest Germans. They were well beyond combat age and they were just more or less the guards, that's all they were. Uh, there was one guy who, when we went in to be searched, we were strip searched, and you wouldn't know this, but there was a uh, comic stri strip at the time, Terry and the Pirates, and there was a guy in it who was Big Stoop, and he was a very big man. And this guy he reminded everybody of Big Stoop, but he actually threw one guy out over a petition because he wasn't getting dressed fast enough. So when I heard that, or saw that, I only weighed about 150 pounds, and I, I got dressed very quickly. I didn't get tangled up with Big Stoop. And eventually we were moved into the barracks, and we, we slept in uh, two-tiered bunks. There were probably 10 guys in a room, maybe 12, I'm not sure. And we had straw ticks. And they gave you a couple of boards um, to support the tick. Now, when they did a search, if you had a wide board and split it up to spread it out, they took that part away from you. You're only allowed to have three boards in there. So now your, your uh, mattress or whatever you want to call it sagged a little bit more. And uh, <coughs> I was in that room with one of my crewmen and then I was also there with a guy from Boston. He was an Irish cop from Boston and we later in a forced march were, were uh, buddies and I'll tell you more about that later in my story. And life began to get, it was very monotonous really, there wasn't anything to do. Uh, we walked around and it was at that time, it wasn't, the weather wasn't that bad. It was July, August. So we walked around the compound. And if you've seen, and we played a little bit of touch football and some softball. And if you've seen any of the movies where, like The Great Escape or anything, they had a short railing away from the outer fence. And if you threw a football in there or a softball and dared to go in and get it, they would shoot you and kill you. The guards eventually would get the thing and throw it back to you. We had a small library, nothing, nothing much. We spent a lot of time. I had a fireman from Detroit who taught me cribbage. We played a lot of cribbage. And it really was not that bad. We didn't get much to eat. We, we had two meals a day. What kind of food did you get? Well, the meal in the morning was barley soup, watery soup. Uh, sometimes there were, there was some meat, and I remember one time they brought us, this was dinner, they brought us a, and it came in a big bucket. One of the guys from the barracks was allowed to go out, go down, get the ration, bring it back. And there was an animal head in the, in the bucket, and they were trying to decide, a couple of hillbillies from Tennessee, whether it was a dog or a pig's head. I don't think we ever made up our mind what it was, but I decided, what the hell difference does it make? Let's eat it. Now, the soup was always very watery. We got 
a piece of black, well, we got a half a loaf of black bread, which had a lot of sawdust in it, large content of sawdust. And if you kept it for a week and threw it up against the wall, you couldn't break the bread, but you could put a dent in the wall. Now, they also, one of the other mainstays was uh, boiled potatoes. And it, that was it. I mean, there was no, oh, we used to get Red Cross parcels. And they were split, one between two. We'd get the chocolate bars in there, cigarettes. I didn't smoke, so I used to trade for candy bars. I did pretty well with that. Uh, and we, you know, we, as a matter of fact, on all of the barrack walls, there was a trading uh, schedule how much a pack of cigarettes was worth, how much a, can a Hershey bar was worth, and so on. And uh, I remember we got to Christmas time, oh, we got raisins in the package too. And some fella saved the raisins, and around Christmas or New Year's, I forget which it was, they uh, made some raisin jack. And they got, of course, it wouldn't be hard to get drunk at that time, you weren't eating anything. Germans couldn't figure where they got the stuff to get drunk. Uh, I remember one German guard talking to me, saying that we would win the war. He said, there's no question that you will win the war. I said, why do you say that? <clears throat> he says, well, if we send a thousand planes over today and you shoot down a hundred, we send back 950. If you send a thousand planes over and we shoot down a hundred, the next day you send a thousand planes back. He says, it's just a matter of time. You're making them in America, we're making them in Germany, and the ones from America are coming over, bombing the factories where we're building them. He says, eventually it's a, a war of attrition. Uh, I'm a Roman Catholic, and the Germans, we used to have rosary every night in our barrack. And all of the other guys who were non-Catholic, Jewish or whatever, would, when we went into the latrine to do it, they would give us 10 or 15 minutes in there every night. And uh, I'll t tell you, people say, how did you get through it? I think two things allowed me to get through it. My faith was one, but my, the other fact was that I was a young man. And now, later on in this narration, you'll hear about some older guys, how hard it is how difficult it got for them. And I've come through it physically, I think, a lot better than some of the older guys, too, because I was young. To find an older guy? 30. 30? Yeah. Okay. They're on the verge of being uh -huh. too old to be drafted. This, uh -huh. this cop was about 30 years old. Uh -huh. uh, we began, we were told, too, by our officers not to try to escape. First of all, you don't know what's out there. You have no idea where you are. You probably die and freeze to death out there if you don't get shot by the German guards going out or shot by civilians if they catch you. This was 19, I was shot down July 14th, July 14th 1944. Now, did, did you have American officers in your camp? Yes. Yeah. They didn't separate. Uh, yeah, well, they were in a separate, yes. Okay. Uh, so this was late 1944, and the war was beginning to turn the right way. So they said, don't, don't be foolish. We're going to win the war. You'll get out of here eventually in one piece. And then around January, we began to hear rumors that uh, they were going to evacuate the camp. There were four separate compounds, and I think somebody has said there were somewhere between twelve and 15,000 prisoners in it. And a friend of mine who um, is in the, the POW group that were, he went out in a train. Well, when it became our turn to go out, there were no trains left. So we began to walk. We took with us what we could carry. We had, we had winter overcoats and 
boots and stuff like that. But a, a GI overcoat at that time was not the best thing for going on a forced march. We went during th almost three months. It was actually 80 days. We walked over 600 miles. Sometimes 10 miles a day, sometimes 5 miles. Some days we'd sit one time during, and we had very little to eat. I mean, if you think we were getting very little to eat back at the prison camp, this was, because they had no way of carrying rations with us. They would stop in a German farm, and if there were any potatoes there, they would confiscate them and boil them. A couple of times we'd get into a farm, and the American ingenuity, we'd steal a couple of chickens and cook them ourselves, and well, one time during the march, we went four days with nothing to eat. This is after having not had much. And as a friend of mine said, if when people talk about being obese, they have a thyroid problem or some other problem. He said, would you ever see a fat prisoner of war? Well, we were the epitome of that. I mean, we were skin and bones, that's what we were. Finally, on the fourth day, we reached another prison camp, and we went in and uh, we found out that there were some British soldiers, there were Indian troops, and that they had some American Red Cross packages. So we went down and we began to trade. I traded my shoes, which were very good, for a can of Spam, and I didn't know at the time why he would give up a can of Spam, but being Hindu, they didn't eat beef, okay? And guys traded their belts and whatever, and we went back and had something to eat. But I had to then walk the rest of the way in these old broken down shoes that this guy had with holes in them and everything else. Now Dan Toomey, the Boston cop that I had met in prison camp, was we stayed together in, in pairs, and he and I were buddies. And I remember one night, it was outside of Berlin, we could see the raids, air raids in Berlin, raining, something awful. And I got up sometime early in the morning, and he went down, they had a campfire, and he said to me, how the hell can you sleep with this rain? I said, damn, when you're tired, you can sleep any place, and it's unbelievable. Now, I don't sleep well sometimes when I travel in a hotel room today, but that was a lot different. And then we proceeded to continue the march, and uh, this would be sometime in late April, and we noticed that the guards began to get nicer and nicer. They gave us some of the other things that happened that I forgot. Some of the guys were in very bad physical condition, and uh, if they weren't able to make it, the Germans would just throw them by the wayside and either kill them or leave them for the German people to do whatever they wanted with them. I know one guy, a friend of mine from Long Island, he was not in the same march as me, but he was in another march. He carried a guy the last three days, carried him on his back to save his life. And then eventually we were in a, a, a uh, farmyard. I, I can remember it was a very nice sunny day and the rumors began to circulate that we were going to be liberated. Because we had been followed by a Piper Cub airplane, and we were later found out it was General Terry Allen's. We don't know if he was in it, but it was his airplane. And they were arranging for surrender, and we walked into a town of Bitterfeld, southeast of Berlin. And white flags on all the buildings, and we walked up, and the German guards handed over their guns to the soldiers, and we were liberated. They had some K-rations, which we grabbed and ate, and got sick as hell, had diarrhea the next day. And uh, then they took us again, and you know, there's an interesting thing. I went from being liberated at Bitterfeld to a place in Le Havre called Camp Lucky Strike. It's 
where they were getting ready to bring us back. They named them after cigarettes. But I personally don't remember whether they flew me or by train. And I read an article in our POW magazine. Some guys accusing them of having doped us to get us there. And I don't know what he meant by it. But I do remember that I don't know how I got there. I don't think, I think his was some fantastic dream or something. Anyway, we spent a, a few weeks there. And they did something to us then that I've recently read that they never would do today to a prisoner of war. They gouged us with all the food we wanted, made us drink eggnogs twice a day out of a canteen cup. Worst thing in the world for people who hadn't been eating regularly. You're supposed to take them back gradually. And uh, we got on a boat called the Admiral Benson, and three and a half, four days later, we were back in in Fort, uh, we were back in New York, and I remember the band playing a very popular tune at that time. It was called "Don't Fence Me In," because the boat was full of former POWs. And that's basically my story. I don't know if you have any questions on anything that might uh, that I can elaborate on. Do you know how much weight you lost yeah. while you were? I was about 156, and I was about 100 when I was liberated. Mm -hmm. And I weigh about 160, 170 right now. How, what kind of effect did that uh, heavy diet, the uh, eggnog and so, what kind of effect did that have on you? Oh, I put weight on. What they were trying to do was mm -hmm. to get us back right. so that when our people saw us, we wouldn't be emaciated. Yeah. That's really what the idea was. So it didn't have any effect on your... Do you get diarrhea or anything from this? No, or, you know? no, not at that time. Okay. <coughs> now, one of the other things, comments I'd like to make, <coughs> is that while it sounds like a terrible experience that I went through, and it certainly was a terrible experience, and it's probably not as bad as or any worse than a lot of other combat soldiers were in, but one thing about it, it stood me in good stead as I went through life. When people at work would, I worked at IBM and they'd complain about things, I'd say, you don't know what bad is. I mean, this is easy. Tomorrow everything will be fine, but that's not the way it was for 10 months. And I, I, it took me through life pretty much that same way. I just, uh, I took the bad bumps with the, with the good ones. Did all of your crew survive? Yeah, I still hear from one of them, the tail gunner, he's out in Montana or someplace. He's the same age as me, he's from Pennsylvania, he weighed about the same as I did. Tells me now he weighs 280 pounds. Now did you all stay together for the whole time? What do you mean, in prison camp? Yeah. No, uh, I didn't see him after the march because we were in groups of maybe 50 people. So he was in a different barracks. So didn't see anybody from my crew again, didn't hear from any of them when I got back, had contact with the other waste gunner from uh, Syracuse, but uh, was a brief, so the only one that I, I really keep in contact with is Joe Monteleone. Now the Boston cop was another interesting story. He and I very good friends, very close. And after the war, friends of mine went to a wedding in Boston. He was from Quincy, Mass. And he heard them mention Beacon. And he asked them if they knew me, and they said, certainly. And they said he began to cry when he heard that. He wrote me one letter. He got my address from them. I sent him back another letter. Never heard from him again. I went to Boston on a convention about 15 years ago. Picked up the phone and there was one Deke uh, uh, to me in Quincy, Mass. And I started to dial a number and then I put it down and my wife says, what's the matter? I said, well, maybe it's better off. That could be his grandson, his son. Mm -hmm. Maybe he died. Maybe I, don't, maybe I don't need to know what happened to him. Maybe I'd be better off leaving it the way it is. 
Some fellows from the camps are still uh, very close to. But see, some of the prisoners of war, if you were in an infantry outfit, you were with the same guy for a very long time. We were only together for maybe a couple of months. We didn't build up that uh, comradeship that an infantry uh, tr group does that been together for a year or two years. You said um, that uh, the effects of the camp were different in older prisoners. Right. Um, could you go back about that? What? Well, I think that they came back with health problems mm -hmm. uh, as soon as they got back. More from a stomach and ulcer kind of problem. Uh, some some of them uh, with PTSD, and they find didn't find it out until later. They really didn't know what PTSD was at the time. But almost every prisoner of war suffers from some PTSD. Why do you tell us what that means? I know, you know post traumatic stress okay. syndrome. Mm -hmm. I still have dreams of being captured. Uh, and I was talking to a guy the other day who was in Nam. He said, I didn't know what PTSD was until one day he worked at IBM. Came out of one of the buildings in a helicopter. Came over bringing the CEO to the, the pad. He says, it scared the hell out of me. It brought back being over in those fields in Vietnam with the helicopters flying around. Some of them are, some of our people are much more there's as much as 50, 60 percent PTSD. Some of them had problem holding jobs. Almost all of us have ulcers, traumatic arthritis. Uh, some have berry, had berry, berry, irritable bowel. I had that for years, and my doctor could never figure out what the problem was until I finally went for a physical for a, uh, with I, with with. Uh, the other thing was that most all prisoners of war came out didn't think anything about benefits and when I say benefits any uh, kind of a uh, pension or anything. It wasn't until 1984, roughly 1984, that the government began to have what they called protocol physicals on POWs, checking on what conditions they had. And Congress through the years have come up with things called presumptives, which means if you have an ulcer, they presume you got it when you were a prisoner of war because there were no medical records on any prisoner of war. If a, if a man got hurt in combat, there was a record that the doctor could look at. Even if we got shot on the way down, it took us to an... Uh, hospital, then they put you in a regular prison camp. They kept no record of what they did for you at that time. And so they came up with all kinds of presumptives. Now you had to go through the physical, make sure you had it. And then a psychiatrist talked to all of the guys and uh, some of them are still having trouble with certain aspects of, of everyday life. It's amazing. And he, I, my wife, we have luncheons, right? And one day, we, we go to Hotel Thayer at West Point. And one day, there were eight of us, four guys and their four wives. And we all got talking about our, some of our experiences. And my wife said to me later, I never heard half of what you were talking about at that. Because we didn't talk much about it. Today, since I've been active in the POW group, I'm now the New York State commander, and I make, I go and make talks at high schools and things like that, and so people have, who have known me for a long time have become aware of the fact that I was a prisoner of war. I worked at IBM for years, and guys didn't know it. I played golf with a guy who was a prisoner of war, and we didn't know it, because we didn't talk about it. How we found out was the state issued POW plates. And then we realized we were both prisoners. Did you ever use the GI Bill when you returned? Yeah, I bought a house with the GI Bill. Other than that, I, <coughs> I didn't go to college because my brother started a business. 
he had an appendectomy. I was had already put applications into <coughs> Syracuse and a couple of other. And he had an appendectomy. And in those days, you had to stay in the hospital for 10 days, maybe recuperate. So I was working in Greenhaven Prison as a fire clerk. And I took over the business <laughs> for him. So when he got out, we stayed in the business. But sometime early 50s, we decided to sell the business. And then I went to work for IBM. Did you ever use the 5220 club? Nope. I was home one week. That's how I got a job in, in Greenhaven Prison. I went into the post office, and there was a postmistress at the time that I had worked for before, trying to get a job there. Because I had hung around with the 5220 guys one week at the diner, go to the American Legion Hall and shoot baskets, go back to the diner and have coffee, and I said, I can't do this. This drives me nuts. So I went in to see Mrs. Murphy, and she said, well, I can't hire you right away. But she says, I'm sure in another three or four months I'll be able to take you on. So I don't know, I ran into somebody who told me that they were, it was then a federal prison, it's now a state. So I went out there and I got a job as a file clerk. And I only stayed there, well I quit when my brother opened the uh, business. And I don't know if you remember the name Wes Westrom, the baseball player from the Giants, catcher, before your time probably. He was out there as a sergeant at the time. And this is not part of my, my war experience, but just let me tell you this. There was a young, young fellow out there, very uh, congenial young prisoner, and he was a uh, trustee. He used to come into my department and other departments, and everybody liked him. And one woman used to bring him home for, he came from a very wealthy family in St. Louis, and used to take him home for weekends. She had two daughters. I think she was trying to get him married off to one of them. One day I picked up, we rode a bus, and the bus stopped right in front of the newspaper stand. I picked up a New York Daily News. There's this picture. He was, had stolen a P-38 over in Italy, and they were after him. Well, a local newspaper guy called me and said, do you know him, Bob? I said, well, I, don't, I know him. But call Mrs. Shea. She used to have him home for dinner. He called me back a few months later. He said, she doesn't even know who you're talking about. She didn't want to be connected with them then. Now, were, were you a member of the Caterpillar Club? Yeah, I still have the card someplace at home. One other interesting thing, it might not be interesting to you, I just received the Purple Heart. Originally, the Purple Heart, you had to bleed to get the Purple Heart. Mm -hmm. Then after uh, Bosnia, there were two pilots that were shot down and beaten to death, not beaten to death, but beaten and then liberated, and they were awarded the Purple Heart. And some of the POWs, and even some combat soldiers, said, wait a minute, that happened to us too, what's the difference? And they did change the, uh, and Congressman Hinchy, it took him about eight months before they finally awarded the Purple Heart. I got it about two years ago. And uh, they like to have a nice ceremony. Well, I'm on a committee with the director at Castle Point, and uh, I'll never get even with him what he did. He sent it out over the e email and to everybody in the hospital, had a big sign out front, had the congressman, had his boss come and when they awarded the Purple Heart. It was very nice, but I was thinking I'd go into the director's office and the congressman would give me the medal and I'd go home. How about you said uh, was six of your brothers were in service? Did they all survive? I'm the only one who even came close. Another brother in Italy is an armorer on a uh, fighter group, the 12th Air Force. He and I met the day before I was shot down. And uh, he tried to contact me a few days later and was told that I... Uh, and of course they didn't know I was missing in action for about four or five months before they got the the telegram that said I was a prisoner of war. But it's very interesting. Uh, I remember the first time after I got home that I went over, and I only lived a block away from the Alps, 
And I remember the first time I walked down there and uh, I met guys and uh, we never talked about, they were in other divisions of combat. We never talked about it. Just never talked about it. And many of the guys today, uh, their children find it very difficult to get anything out of them. Some guys would have a very hard time uh, doing this kind of an interview. Mm -hmm. You may have even run across that. Mm -hmm. We had one fellow down at the uh, VA office in, in Houston Street. They wanted some people to come in, kind of part of a sensitivity training to tell their experiences. And he got halfway through his and he broke down. He couldn't finish. Okay, well, thank you very much for All right. a very good interview.